I'm definitely not over exaggerating if I say that this is the most important video of this whole series about special relativity. Because today I'm going to talk about the postulates of special relativity and I feel that I didn't give them enough space in previous video and I can't stress enough how crucial the proper understanding of these postulates is. But I also want to talk about the definition of inertial frame because I noticed that people can be too philosophical about this. So what is the inertial frame of reference? It is also something that needs to be defined, right? Otherwise we can just argue forever about all sorts of philosophical stuff about it and we don't get any progress out of this. Physics is not philosophy, you know. We have to have things defined and there has to be no doubt about this definition, like what it precisely means. So we need to do this also for inertial frame to have a proper discussion about physics. So the proper definition of inertial frame is like this. When you are in inertial frame, things around you are moving with a constant velocity if there is not applied force on them. If you are inertial frame, you would immediately know, like from experience, you know that you are floating around, for example, in a space or on International Space Station, they're all in locally inertial frames. So, like from experience, you would be able to tell immediately. But for more proper definition, we can maybe define it through an accelerometer. This is such a device that you have this heavy object in the middle and springs in all, all directions. And if there is some deviation of this heavy object in the middle, then you know that there is a force applied to it. So you just take this device everywhere you go with you. And if it detects zero acceleration, then you know you are in inertial frame if you can't tell from your own experience. And for special relativity, just this definition is good enough. You don't need anything more philosophical than this. So inertial frame has zero acceleration. Hold on a moment, actually. If we were in a gravitational field falling down, it also wouldn't detect any acceleration, right? But if you are in a gravitational field, there is acceleration because, for example, Earth is pulling you down towards its center. If you are in a falling elevator like here, you wouldn't even know that you are in a gravitational field. So how can you know that there is a force applied to you? Because this force is applied the same way for every atom in this device. So everything is accelerated with the same rate and there is no way you can actually say whether you are or you are not in accelerated frame. It's true that the global inertial frame doesn't exist because there are these massive objects everywhere in the universe. We can't avoid them. Therefore, we always talk about just local inertial frames, you know, because if you are deep in space, this gravitational force is applied the same way on every object around you in close distance. So you can't actually distinguish any deviation from global inertial frame. And you can freely use special relativity in this small region in space, but you can't use special relativity if you are truly able to distinguish some acceleration in this frame. 
And this is also a reason why Einstein wasn't satisfied with special relativity, because it didn't contain gravity. And that was the reason why he invented general relativity. But for now, gravity doesn't exist. And this also means that we have a global inertial frame. And this is our definition for now. But some people have this problem where you have two objects and they are moving relative to each other. And then their relative movement changes. And we can't seem to distinguish which one actually changed its direction. And this is very important in special relativity because we have to know which object was inertial all the time and which was not. And some people say that we are incapable of this. And I want to just argue that this is not true. We can always distinguish these things. And it's because we can say that there are infinite number of inertial observers in a universe. And if all these observers are watching these two objects, then they will always agree on which one of them change its direction. There is no any observer in a universe that would disagree, for example, that this left object changed its direction. Because no matter how you are moving, for example, in this animation, we are moving now, so we are in different frame, but we also see the right object change its direction. But if we are moving in this direction, we see the same thing. We are always able to distinguish this. So since we have this inertial frame defined, and again, just take your accelerometer, and if it detects zero acceleration, then you are in an inertial frame, no matter if you are falling down to Earth. You can always apply the special relativity in this case. Then we can actually proceed to the first postulate of special relativity. Physical laws are the same for every inertial observer in a universe, and this is regardless of their velocity or position. And this tells you that there is no privileged frame of reference in the entire universe, like ether, for example. And this means that the result of an experiment is going to be the same no matter what the reference frame you are in. So this gives you the freedom to pick any reference frame you want to describe an experiment and you always have to get the same result. Imagine this box that represents an experiment and you have two possible outcomes of this experiment. You can have either A and then B, or B and then A. And these are two possible outcomes. And if in one reference frame you have A and then B, then no matter how fast you are moving relative to this experiment or where you are in the universe, this sequence is going to be the same for all observers. So always there will be A first and then B. But now this is important because we consider that A is a cause of B or other way around. But what if we separated these two boxes with some distance D? Then we have to ask is this still one experiment or are they two experiments at the same time? Because if it's still true that A is a cause of B, then yeah, I can argue that this is also the same experiment. And such real life experiment would be this grenade next to a person. And if this grenade explodes, then this person dies. It's straightforward, right? So we can say that the death 
of this person is caused by the explosion of this grenade. So we have first explosion and then we have the death of this person. So these are two causally connected events. And this has to be true for the entire universe, for all observers. It would be really weird if this wasn't the case, right? But if we separated this grenade with some distance, then this grenade would explode and this person would die after the explosion reached him, then this is still true. For the entire universe, this must be the same. The cause is the explosion and the effect is this person dying. It's one experiment still. But it can happen that this person dies before this explosion reach him. Then is this still the same experiment? Because now it's weird because this explosion is not a cause of this person dying, but these two events are so-called causally disconnected and they cannot be considered as one experiment. And now Nothing prevents us to see these two events happening in different order now. Now you can get too philosophical about this, right? Because you might ask, how can nature know how fast this explosion is spreading? And therefore, how can it know whether these two events are causally connected or not? But the answer to this is very simple because it is about the information whether this grenade have already exploded or not. And information is spreading with the speed of light. And that's it. You can imagine you are this observer here and you are looking at these two boxes. And these two boxes give an output at the same time and you reach these two signals at the same time. Then you immediately know that there, there is no way one signal could reach the other and therefore you immediately know that these two events were causally disconnected when they happened. But if the time interval between these two observations from these two boxes is big enough that you know that the information from this box must have reached the second box, then you know that these two boxes are causally connected and therefore they can be considered as one experiment. And therefore the result of this experiment must be the same for the entire universe. And this is the powerful part of this postulate. Now you have the freedom to pick whatever reference frame you want in a universe and you have to always get the same result. Of course, mathematically the easiest way to describe this experiment is to describe it in its own rest frame. Now it's time to talk about the second postulate of relativity which says that the speed of light is the same in every reference frame and this is independent of the relative motion of the source. This means that all these observers are gonna measure the same speed for this light beam, no matter how fast and in which direction they are moving. And this also means that a light beam can't be catched up with another light beam, even if it's released by a moving observer. Both these light beams will travel with a speed of light away from him. But it is not possible to create an animation that could actually capture this effect. So these animations are rather confusing, I would say, because this whole screen serves as a one observer and this observer would see this. There is a light moving with a speed of light and there is this spaceship chasing the light with a flashlight on the top. After this ship turns on the flashlight, this observer would see both light beams traveling with the same speed, but he will also see this spaceship chasing these two light beams, so the speed difference between the spaceship and the light beams 
will be smaller than C. On the other hand, if you look at this in a reference frame of the observer in a spaceship, then he can claim he's at rest and this light beam is traveling away from him with a speed of C. And after turning on the light beam, both these light beams are traveling with the same speed C away from him. And of course, he would see our first observer moving in opposite direction. Isn't this weird though? How can something be moving with the same speed for everyone? This totally breaks the common sense, right? Well, this is not something that we just made up, but it's an experimental fact. Since we know that this must be true, we have to sacrifice something to force this law. Otherwise, it can't work in normal physics. And the thing we have to sacrifice here is time. Time cannot be absolute anymore. Time must be ticking with different speeds for different observers. And there is the time dilation. Remember the Galilean transformations where T prime is just T, so it doesn't transform? In Lorentz transformations, we have this extra nasty term for time. So these are the postulates of special relativity. And I'm going to use this as my starting point when deriving more complicated phenomena in special relativity like relativity of simultaneity. So I hope it is clear enough and we are all in the same footing now. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching and if you like it just give it a like as it helps spreading this video to more people and uh, if you like this content in general you can subscribe i always appreciate it and i see you in the next video